My name is Jeff Wilson. By day, I invest in tech companies. And at night, I invest in sports cards. Join me on my journey to profit from the hobby we all love. Hello, sports card investors, and welcome to another episode, a very important episode. Because today, I am going to give you an investment strategy that is going to make you money. This is a strategy, I have gone back and looked at data and this is a strategy that can be replicated, that can be used in the upcoming months, in the upcoming years to make money. But it's not the strategy you probably think it is. So you are gonna have to pay attention to today's episode because we've got some good stuff going on. And what we are talking about is should you invest in soon to be Hall of Famers? This is a topic that I've been thinking about. A lot of the audience has written in saying they wanted to do an episode on this topic. So I dived into doing a lot of research, looking at previous Hall of Fame classes and looking at what would have happened if you invested in those Hall of Famers at different points. And I looked across all four major sports. So we're looking at baseball, football, basketball, and hockey. And what I found was pretty surprising. And I can't wait to share that information with you today. Uh, But first, I wanted to give a special thanks to a couple of people who have written awesome articles for my blog. And guys, you have to read these articles. As you know, a couple of episodes ago, I announced a new article submission program where I'm offering the opportunity for everybody listening to write articles for sportscardinvestor.com about your theories or approaches to investing in sports cards. The first two articles are live. We have an article from uh, Joel Agu, uh, Modeling Superstar Hitters to Evaluate Baseball Prospects. And guys, this article is full of some really great information, statistics that you can look at to understand what's happening with baseball prospects and to start to perhaps figure out which baseball prospects are going to turn into the next big thing. You want to go read that article right now on sportscardinvestor.com. Also, a great article I just posted um, from Jason Flasteris comparing comic books to cards. So Jason is a big comic book collector and investor, and he is taking some of his experiences in the comic book world and bringing those over to the sports card world. So it's a really interesting parallel looking at comic books versus looking at cards. Those two episodes are on sportscardinvestor.com. Check them out. More importantly, when you go to sportscardinvestor.com, there is a box for you to put in your email address. Just below the header area, it says sign up for our free newsletter. And if you put in your email, I will send you an email just once a week. I won't spam you, just once a week. And I'll let you know what the new articles and videos that are coming out on that are. That's how you're gonna find out about new articles that people are posting through my article submission program. And I'm telling you, you're gonna wanna read the articles that are coming out because they're gonna give you a leg up in the marketplace. They're gonna give you tips and tricks for how you can make more money as a sports card investor. So make sure to go put in your email on sportscardinvestor.com. And of course, if you're interested in writing articles for sportscardinvestor.com, just go to my website, click the article submissions link in the main menu bar. I'm giving out a $250 reward each month to the best article. So you do not want to miss this opportunity. Give me an article, get that opportunity to win the prize and get the notoriety that's gonna come along with being published on the website. So those are great new articles. Thank you, Joel, and thank you, Jason, for leading us off there. All right, so let's get to the topic at hand today. Does it pay to invest in soon-to-be Hall of Famers? And this topic, this topic is close to my heart, and here's why. I have gotten feedback. There is a, there is a contingent of people who watch this show who have given me feedback that I cover, mainly cover modern sports cards, and I mainly cover a lot of rookies or, or, or players who are kind of young in their career. And, and I have had people say to me, that's speculation. Investing is buying proven guys, buying Hall of Famers. I've had some people kind of get on their high horse and say, I would never invest in the rookies or the young guys. I just invest in Hall of Famers because that's what investing actually is. 
you, you know, investing in the young guys, that's just pure speculation and all you're doing is setting yourself up for disaster. But investing in the Hall of Famers, that's actually where the money is and where the appreciation is over time. Are they right? Do you think they're right? <laughs> we got some interesting data to go through today to answer that question and to give you some tips. So let's get right to it. Here's what I did. I've looked at the Hall of Fame classes across all four major sports, and I want to start with baseball. The 2019 Baseball Hall of Fame class, these guys were announced at the beginning of the year who the Hall of Famers were going to be this year. It was Mariano Rivera, Roy Halladay, Edgar Martinez, and Mike Mussina were the four Hall of Famer, Famers this year for baseball. Uh, and then they all got inducted uh, back in July of this year. So how did their card values fare over the last few years leading up to their announcement as becoming a Hall of Famer and then their induction as a Hall of Famer? Was there a spike when they got inducted into the Hall of Fame? Was there a general increase as they approached getting into the Hall of Fame? Let's take a look at the numbers. Let's start with Mariano Rivera. Probably, certainly the best known guy in the last Hall of Fame class, one of the best Hall of Famers, uh, you know, in baseball period, one of the best closers in the history of baseball. So what you're looking at if you're watching YouTube is you're looking at a value, the values of his 1992 Bowman PSA 10 eBay sales history for auctions on eBay for the last couple of years. And there are, there are, and I'm going to describe this to you if you're listening on the podcast. The numbers that I started tracking starting at the beginning of 2018, these cards were trading for a little over $200 each. And then all of a sudden in early 2019, a spike occurred and a major, major spike occurred. And if you're looking on YouTube, there's a yellow line drawn vertical line where this spike occurred. The card spiked all the way up to between four to 500. And in fact, a couple sold for over $500. So you're talking about a cards that were selling consistently between 200 and 300 dollars for much of 2018. As we got towards late 2018, they started to go over $300. And then as we got into January of 2019, all of a sudden those cards started spiking and selling for over $400. What happened? What happened was Mariano Rivera was announced that he had made it into the Hall of Fame. That happened in January of 2019. And the moment that announcement occurred, his card prices spiked significantly. But that's not the end of the story. If you go back and look at my graph, there is, there is a, if you look at his card prices throughout 2019, they then kind of, they're a bit volatile. They actually come down a little bit off of when uh, it was announced that he was going to be part of the Hall of Fame class. And then there's a second yellow line. That second yellow line, which is in July of 2019, represents when his actual Hall of Fame induction occurred, when the ceremony occurred. And what is actually really, really surprising is that the ceremony, the actual induction into the Hall of Fame did not cause his card prices to increase. In fact, his card prices softened a little bit after he was actually inducted into the Hall of Fame. So what you might think, you know, as if, if someone were to have asked me before I looked at the data, you know, if they had asked the question, would actually being inducted into the Hall of Fame help somebody's card prices, I would have probably said yes. But looking at the data with Mariano Rivera, getting inducted into the Hall of Fame did not actually help his card prices. What helped his card prices tremendously was getting announced that he was going to be in the Hall of Fame class. That happened back in January whereas the actual induction happened in July. And there was a little bit of a run-up in prices right before that announcement occurred. So really interesting data on Mariano Rivera. Now, the other thing to look at is, despite the Hall of Fame announcements, was he a good investment overall over the course of time? If you go back to early, the beginning of 2018, before Hall of Fame was on the radar, uh, all the way to the end of 2019. So basically from before Hall of Fame was starting to be really talked about actively until after the induction happened and things have kind of cooled off since then, have his card prices gone up overall? And the answer is yes. You've seen the card prices increase from the low $200 to the mid $300 if you look at those two time periods. So yes, 
he has seen a pretty substantial increase in his card values over the last two years. It is no question that he is a he has been a good long-term investment. And there's also no question that his announcement of getting into the Hall of Fame caused a spike. Um, his actual induction into the Hall of Fame didn't do as much for him. But from a long-term standpoint, he has been a great investment. Well, how does this stand up with the other baseball players who got inducted into last year's Hall of Fame, guys who are not quite as popular, not quite considered to be as much of an all-time great as Mariano Rivera. Let's look at Roy Halladay. What you're now seeing on the screen is Roy Halladay's card prices. And I actually went all the way back to 2010. I said, let's take a longer sample period just to look at a little bit of a longer history of sale prices because he has not had as many cards sold overall. What you will see is that his cards around 2010, we're trading at around $100. This is his 1997 Bowman Chrome PSA 10. And they were at $100 for a few years. They actually fell off after he retired. They actually kind of fell down in 2014, 2015, 2016. His card prices uh, really, really went down um, at the end of his career into his retirement. Um, and then they started to come back up as we got into 2017 and 2018, leading towards where his announcement for the Hall of Fame was going to take place. And that announcement where he, where it was actually announced that he made the Hall of Fame class happened in early 2019. And the moment that happened, his card prices spiked. We saw the same trend with him that we saw with Mariano Rivera. We saw a major spike in his card prices. His card prices went from a little bit under $200 to about $350 the moment that it was announced that he was going to be part of the Hall of Fame class. Now, in his case, when he actually got inducted, his cards went up a little bit further. Um, his cards actually have now broken $400. This is his, again, his 97 Bowman Chrome PSA 10. These are cards that were being sold for literally $30 Back in 2014, 2015, and at times in 2016, they were like $40. And now these same cars are over $400 since this guy has gotten into the Hall of Fame. So Roy Halladay has seen a tremendous increase in his card prices. Did the same hold true for the other Hall of Famers last year for baseball? What about Edgar Martinez? Now, Edgar Martinez, I simply looked at over the course of the last two years. Edgar Martinez followed... Uh, he has not had as much activity on his cards, but he followed a little bit of a similar pattern. There was a spike around the time that he was announced that he made the Hall of Fame class. There was a spike, a little spike that occurred, just a brief spike happened actually with him just before the announcement. And then in the days following the announcement, there was a little bit of a spike and then his card prices kind of went back down. Now he did not see a boost from actually getting inducted. So much like Mariano Rivera, Edgar Martinez's prices kind of reset to where they were before the announcement of him getting into the Hall of Fame. But when the actual announcement was made, there was a temporary spike in his card prices. Mike Mussina, same thing. If we look at Mike Mussina's 1991 Leaf Gold Rookie PSA 10, uh, the first line is when it was announced that he had made the Hall of Fame class. There was a spike. His card prices were, a, this card was a little bit under $100. And then right when it was announced that he was making the Hall of Fame, those cards went up to about $150 and traded there for a little while. Then they came back down. And actually, once he got inducted into the Hall of Fame, since the time he's gotten inducted, they've been hovering somewhere around $100 again. Um, so a little bit more than what they were prior to the announcement. But the announcement of him getting into the Hall of Fame caused a big spike. Now, those were the four guys who got uh, elected into the Hall of Fame this year in baseball. Really though, Mariano Rivera was out of those four, certainly the most popular, certainly the most activity in terms of his cards being sold, the number of graded cards of him, all that type of thing. So whereas the other guys, Roy Halladay, Edgar Martinez, and Mike Mussina, there isn't as much data on, there's not as many cards uh, graded, there's not as many cards being sold. So I wanted to go back and look in prior classes as well to see if the pattern that we saw especially with Mariano Rivera, if that pattern uh, replicates itself among some of the bigger name guys in the previous classes. So I went back to the uh, 2017 class, or the 2018 class actually. I went back to the 2018 class and looked at Chipper Jones. A uh, big hitter, popular player. Uh, I figured he would be a good guy to look at. And this is Chipper Jones, 
1991 Bowman PSA 10 sale prices. So what we saw happen with Chipper Jones, the first line was when it was announced that he had made the Hall of Fame. And so for those of you listening on the podcast, his prices of these uh, 91 Bowman PSA 10s were a little bit under 50 bucks. The moment it was announced he made the Hall of Fame, there was a spike in these card prices and these card prices approached $75. So we saw we saw a decent, uh, a decent spike in his card prices. Um, that spike continued for a couple of months and then it started to level back off again. When he was actually inducted into the Hall of Fame, not much of a spike. Uh, the actual being inducted, do, going through the Hall of Fame ceremony didn't cause that much of a spike, not as much of a high point as actually getting announced for being in the Hall of Fame caused. And actually since that point in time, Chipper Jones prices have kind of leveled back off again. So at the moment, uh, these card prices uh, of Chipper Jones 1991 Bowman PSA 10 now in 2019 are really not selling for much more than they were selling for back in 2016. Um, let's look at Jeff Bagwell. So the class previous 2017, Jeff Bagwell was in the 2017 hall of fame class. Let's look at, let's look at what happened with him. Uh, and if you look at this graph, this is his 1991 tops traded PSA 10. Uh, when it was announced that he made it into the hall of fame, which is again, that first line on the graph, that first yellow line, his card prices spiked. So once again, we saw a spike, we saw a spike in card prices, the moment it was announced, he went into the Hall of Fame and then it cooled off. There was a spike period of a few weeks. His card prices came back down to what they were prior to the announcement. And then he was at, when he was actually inducted into the Hall of Fame, when he went through the ceremony a number of months later, his card prices were flat. They never moved. And what's interesting with Jeff Bagwell is what his cards are trading for today in 2019 is around the same value that they were trading for back in 2016 before it was ever announced he was gonna go into the Hall of Fame. So that's an interesting phenomenon. If we look at Jeff Bagwell, Chipper Jones, if we look at um, if we look at uh, Mike Mussina, if we look at Edgar Martinez, all four of those Hall of Famers, their cards today are selling for the same price that their cards sold for well before it was ever announced that they were going into the Hall of Fame. So if your strategy is to simply buy the cards of future Hall of Famers, that strategy by itself is not going to prove successful with all players. In fact, with players as big as Jeff Bagwell and players as big as uh, Chipper Jones, that wasn't a successful strategy. If you went back and bought their cards four years ago, you're sitting on cards today that are around the same price that they were when you bought them. Now, if you bought their cards four years ago and then you sold them the moment, the moment it was announced that they had made it into the Hall of Fame, then yes, you would have gotten good appreciation off of your investment. And we have consistently now seen that same pattern off of every guy who I've looked at so far in this video, that the moment it was announced that they had made the Hall of Fame, that there was an immediate spike in their card prices, a short-lived spike in most cases, but an immediate spike in their card prices. And what I found by going back and looking at some of these eBay auctions is that some very, very savvy card investors knew when the announcement was coming and they set up eBay auctions before the announcement date and set them up to end on the day of the announcement or the day after the announcement so that the auction was already running and then it was announced who was in the Hall of Fame class and then their auction was already set to end the next day. Those sellers are the ones who made the most money. Clearly, those are some savvy individuals who took the foresight to realize what day the announcement was gonna come out about who was gonna go in the Hall of Fame and they took the time to know that that day there was going to be news stories. It was going to lead ESPN, right? Whenever the Hall of Fame class is announced, it's going to lead ESPN. It's going to lead talk radio, sports radio. And they knew this and they knew this in advance. And so they intentionally set up their auctions to end the day after all of that noise was going to occur because they knew, and this is a very, very important takeaway. They knew that people who buy cards are often very reactionary. This whole marketplace of buying and selling cards is very, very reactionary. 
This is why you can make money by flipping cards during the playoffs, by buying the hot guy, by buying guys at the beginning of the playoffs. And if they start to get hot as the playoffs go on, you can flip their cards late in the playoffs and you can make a bundle of cash. It's the same thing here. This is a reactionary market. And if you know that in a major announcement is going to come out about a player, such as, wow, they made it into the Hall of Fame. If you are ready with their cards and you are ready with your auction ending right after that announcement is made, you are really going to benefit from the overreactionary nature of people in this hobby. If you keep that in mind, you stand to make money in this hobby all times through. One of the number one tips that I can give you as a sports card investor is to think about public perception and to, and to think in advance about when public perception and interest about a particular player may spike and to buy cards and have them ready for that moment in time. It's just like uh, uh, several episodes ago, I told you to buy cards of certain backup quarterbacks who I thought had a chance of coming into NFL games this year. Like, for example, Mason Rudolph, because I thought Big Ben might get injured, or Teddy Bridgewater, because I knew that, you know, I knew that um, Drew Brees was 40 years old and, and could possibly get injured this year at some point in time. And the moment those guys came in the games and took over starting quarterback roles, their card prices spiked because people are reactionary. And so as an investor, if you can think one step ahead of the public and you can think about when people might react to something and you can get out in front of that, that is when you stand to make the most money. And that is the case with Baseball Hall of Famers. It is all about when the announcement is first made that they have made the Hall of Fame and you just need to get out right in front of that and consistently across all six of these Baseball Hall of Famers I looked at, you would have made money if you had anticipated that, had the cards in advance, put the auction up, and got out, out in front of it. And by the way, next year's Baseball Hall of Fame class, Derek Jeter is eligible. Derek Jeter is eligible for next year's Baseball Hall of Fame class. So what you just saw happen with Mariano Rivera, with that big spike that occurred when it was announced that he made it into the Hall of Fame, Go buy Derek Jeter cards now. Go buy Derek Jeter cards now because I think, can't guarantee obviously, but the data tells me that we will likely see a spike in Derek Jeter cards the moment he is announced for the Hall of Fame, just like we saw with Mariano Rivera. Also, uh, Jason Giambi is eligible for the first time next year, but I'm not sure he's a first ballot guy, right? Uh, Alfonso Soriano is eligible. And then, of course, we also have some veterans who have been on the ballot for a number of years. Can they finally break through Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, Kurt Schilling, Larry Walker? If any of those guys break through this year, you could see a spike in their card prices as well. But in my opinion, the one surefire guy to go by right now, based on this data, is Derek Jeter. The question now is, Will this same strategy work in the other sports? Let's take a look at football. Now, the 2019 Football Hall of Fame class was a class that, from it, from star power, it was a really, really weak class. We had uh, Champ Bailey, Tony Gonzalez. He's a pretty well-known guy, but there's still not a lot of activity on his cards, um, you know, because he was a tight end. He wasn't a quarterback. There, not a lot of activity. Ty Law, um, Kevin Mawai, Ed Reed, Johnny Robinson, no big, you know, star, no, no quarterbacks there, no wide receivers there, like no, no big stars at the, at the positions that are going to matter to drive card prices. And so I tried to look at the 2019 class and run numbers on the 2019 class, but honestly, their cards were so few and far between and the transactions on their cards were so few and far between that I did not have enough data to be able to do any type of statistically significant analysis on the 2019 class. But the class previous, the 2018 Hall of Fame class was a really, really good class. In that class, we had Randy Moss. In that class, we had Ray Lewis. And in that class, we had Brian Erlocker. So a lot more star power. We also had Terrell Owens and some other players with a lot of star power. But I looked at, the, I looked at Ray Lewis, I looked at Randy Moss, and I looked at Brian Erlocker. So let's take a look at what happened. 
So first of all, now I'm bringing up Ray Lewis's 1996 Bowman Best PSA 10. He was announced, so these cards were trading for around a hundred bucks, uh, around a hundred bucks. They were oscillating around a hundred bucks, uh, pretty consistently throughout 2017. It was announced in early 2018 and January, 2018, that he had made the hall of fame class this year. And guess what happened? His card prices immediately spiked. They went up towards about 140 to 150 bucks. They stayed up there for a couple of weeks. And then we saw a drop back down to where they were before the announcement was made. Now, several months later, over the summer of 2018, he was actually inducted into the Hall of Fame and went through the ceremony. It had zero impact on his card prices, uh, no impact at all. And in fact, since that point in time, his card prices have been trading for, once again, around 100 bucks. So if you had bought Ray Lewis's cards back in 2017 and said, hey, I just want to buy a bunch of these, these guys' cards because he's a Hall of Famer and I'm going to hold these cards forever, well, here you are in 2019 and those cards haven't gone up a single dollar. But if you had sold those cards the moment that it was announced that he had gotten into the Hall of Fame, you would have made a decent appreciation if you had been right there ready to sell right away. Does the same hold true with other football players? Let's look at Randy Moss. Randy Moss's cards, uh, this is his uh, 1998 Topps Chrome PSA 10. A lot of sales of this card the first line is when he it was announced he got into the Hall of Fame. And once again, there was, guess what? An immediate spike in his card prices the moment it was announced he got into the Hall of Fame. Now, Randy Moss also saw a little bit of a spike right around the, well, he actually saw a big spike uh, with a few sales uh, right around the induction ceremony as well. And then his card prices have continued to edge up since then. They, they, they came back down from, from a little bit of the high, but then they started to kind of edge back up over time. So Randy Moss has made a pretty decent long-term investment, but if you had timed selling his cards right before the announcement, once again, you would have done pretty well. And in his case, he actually got a little bit of a bump from the induction into the Hall of Fame as well. Let's look at Brian Urlacher. Same story with Brian Urlacher. When it was announced that Brian Urlacher had made the 2018 Hall of Fame class, he saw an immediate spike in his card prices. His cards then came back down to earth. And when he actually got inducted, in his case, he saw no real spike in his card prices, much like many of the other guys that we have looked at throughout the course of this video. Um, and in fact, Brian Urlacher's card prices right now in late 2019 are not really trading for much more than they were back in 2016. So, you know, the whole idea of uh, buy Hall of Famers and or buy guys who are soon to be Hall of Famers and hold on to them for the long run, the people who, who email into my show and say, you know, you're just a speculator looking at modern cards. If you want to be a true investor, you should buy guys who are, you know, uh, who, who have uh, retired and they'll be in the Hall of Fame someday and you should hold those cards. Eh, like that, that, you know, great. I could have bought a bunch of Brian Urlacher cards or I could have bought a bunch of Ray Lewis cards four years ago. And guess what? I'd still be holding them today and I'd be mad at you for suggesting that I do that because those cards really haven't got up in value very much. Now, once again, if I sold them the day the announcement that they were getting into the Hall of Fame was made, then I would have been very happy that I bought those cards because we would have seen that increase in value. But the idea of just holding these guys for the long term, I really think somebody, in order for that to be effective, I really think somebody has to be a big, 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 big star. I think if you're buying one of the all-time greats, then yes, buy them and hold them. But if it's not an all-time great, Simply being a Hall of Famer does not make you a long-term investment. The two guys in this study that have had a lot of transaction volume, that have seen consistent rise in their prices over time are Mariano Rivera, which was the best, you know, maybe the best overall player out of any of these guys across football or baseball that we've looked at, and uh, Randy Moss. And I think Randy Moss probably has benefited from the fact he's on ESPN and he's likable. He does a lot of segments on ESPN. Um, I actually think that probably has helped Randy Moss's cards, and that may be why we've seen a bit of appreciation overall with him over time. So if you get one of the all-time greats, or if you get somebody who is in the spotlight, then yes, they can make a good long-term investment. But not all Hall of Famers do. 
but you always have the opportunity to sell right when the Hall of Fame announcement is made, if you can anticipate that. So that is baseball and that is football. But what really should matter to you, what really should matter to you above those two sports right now is basketball. Basketball should matter more. And here is why. The next Basketball Hall of Fame class, the 2020 Basketball Hall of Fame class, you have the opportunity. These guys, and this has not been announced yet, who's made the class. I don't think they voted yet. These guys are eligible for the first time. Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, Kevin Garnett. You've also got Chris Bosh. You've also got Elton Brand. And then you've got a couple of real quality players in previous years, like Chauncey Billups and Sean Marion, who may possibly have a chance at making the class as well. But Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, Kevin Garnett, those three guys are sure to be Hall of Famers. We know that. Those guys are going to go in. So the question is, does this same strategy work in basketball? Let's go back in time and see if this strategy works in basketball. Because if this strategy works in basketball, you've got a real opportunity to make money this year. Does it work? And for the answer to that question, you're going to have to tune into my next episode because I'm saving that one back for Wednesday's episode. On Wednesday, we are going to, on my next episode, we are going to look at the history of basketball Hall of Famers. And if this investing strategy of buying guys before they're announced of getting into the Hall of Fame and then selling the moment they're announced that they have made the Hall of Fame, does that strategy work in basketball? I have some really interesting data for you to look at. You are not going to want to miss my next episode. And to make sure that you know about my next episode, please hit the subscribe button and hit the little bell icon because that is the quickest way to be notified of my next episode. So you don't want to miss this. Also, uh, if you go to my website, sportscardinvestor.com, and you put your email address in there, I will send you out emails as new episodes and great new articles through my article submission program come out. You're not going to want to miss that. Hey, guys, I want to give a shout out to my friend Don. Don helped me with a lot of this data compilation that you saw in today's episode. Uh, he did a great job. I appreciate his help. And uh, I'd love to hear what you think of this data so far and what you're gonna do as a result of it, please join me on my Facebook group or my Discord chat server. Both are absolutely free to join and you can join either of them by going to sportscardinvestor.com and clicking on Facebook group or clicking on Discord chat up in the main menu bar. I'm excited guys to have you part of this conversation. My next episode is really gonna be something. Subscribe now and I will see you in a few days. Thanks, bye-bye.